All right. Well, I think we're going to get this thing going, considering it is now noon o'clock. Uh, my name is Ellis Hughes. I'm the organizer of the Seattle Use Our Meetup group. And today we have a wonderful treat in uh, in having uh, folks from our studio here. So we have, excuse me, let me bring up, here we go. So we've got Daniel Fallball here. Um, he's going to be talking, he's the author and maintainer of the Torch package. And he'll present on how to use PyTorch from R and the new advancements in this space. Uh, we can... We know we can use TensorFlow to perform deep, lear deep learning in R, but Torch takes us to the next step further by providing similar functionality in a native R library using libtorch. Um, so we're incredibly excited for this. Uh, also, if you have any other ideas for a meetup, please reach out to me. Uh, you can meet out, uh, reach out to me on meetup.com uh, or you can send me an email. Uh, it's ellishughes at live.com. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Daniel. Daniel, take us away. Hi, thanks, Alice, for the invite and all uh, Meetup organizers. Um, today, I'm going to talk about Torch for R. Thank you, everyone, for watching, too. And the slides for this presentation are available in this short link here. You can just copy paste if you want. And Let's go. Uh, so who am I? I? My name is Daniel. I live in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, I'm sorry for my English speaking. I'm, I'm still learning. So sorry in, in advance. Uh, I'll try to be clear and you, you can answer. You can ask whatever you want in the chat. I'll, I'm reading. There's a small delay, but I'll try to answer as soon as possible. I work as a software engineer at our studio. And I, I am in the multiverse team with Javier, Sigrid, and Itao. We maintain uh, Sparkly R, TensorFlow for R, and Keras uh, things, and now also the Torch uh, package. So I'll, I'm going to talk about uh, what's the Torch package and how it, uh, what are uh, the torch components. Then I'll, I'll do a quick demo and talk about how any of you can contribute to uh, torch development. So what's torch? Torch is an R package with two core features. It has an, an, array, it, uh, an array computation library with strong uh, GPU acceleration. That means that it, you can take uh, any array computation that you want to do, and you can instantly have uh, GPU uh, acceler acceleration for it. And uh, Torch also includes a deep neural networks library built on the tape-based autograd system of, of Torch. I'll, I'll explain, I'll talk about that in just in a minute. So why Torch? Uh, so Torch for R is based on PyTorch and PyTorch is a framework for deep learning that is rapidly increasing popularity, especially among uh, researchers. So in this uh, graph here, you can see uh, that PyTorch has started in 2016 and now it, it takes almost like 50% of papers in, in archive uh, implementations. So it's, it's huge. And we believe that others uh, can use storage uh, GPU acceleration and all the cons com uh, consistent uh, array computation to implement fast machine learning algorithms and whatever you want. We, it's not just machine learning that you can do with Torch. There's also optimization and I don't know, like I, I feel uh, all the creativity of the R community will, will come with that. Okay, so first of all, uh, uh, like I, I won't compare like say Torch is better than that and TensorFlow is better and 
enter this war or something like that. I'll just state some facts about the ecosystem in R and I think this is all you need to decide if you prefer implementing your model in, in TensorFlow or Torch, okay? So Torch for R is in early development and TensorFlow is much more major. Um, Torch for R uses uh, the libtorch, a, a C++ library. So it's native in R and you don't need the Python de dependency that is needed in TensorFlow. And for now, at least, Torch is much uh, lower level API than TensorFlow, than Keras at least. So like you, you need to write much more boiler boilerplate code if you want to use uh, Torch, right? Then uh, Keras has a, a more like uh, concise API, I would say. So how does Torch for R works? Uh, we have libtorch. So the PyTorch team uh, built PyTorch on top of libtorch also. So every tensor operation that you can do in, in, in PyTorch goes down to libtorch. And we, we needed to build Lantern. We, we called this piece of, of software Lantern. And this, uh, what it does is just like a C API for libtorch because R cannot compile in the same compiler that libtorch is used and more other technical uh, uh, problems. So we built this C API for libtorch. And then there's all the RCPP wrappers that calls Lantern code. And then we have the torch underscore uh, functions that are uh, available for you in R. So these three blocks here are all auto-generated from libtorch's declarations. So if a new version of libtorch uh, uh, is released, we can fast, like, from a day of work, we can just update all the all the, the lantern wrappers, then the RCPP wrappers, and all the torch underscore functions, right? And then we built in R directly in R the NN models, optimizers, and data sets that I'll talk about in in the future, in like uh, ten or 20 minutes, I don't know. So these things uh, are implemented direct, directly in R. So I think this is great because you can, you have living examples of uh, most implementations of like LSTMs, uh, ConvNets and, and convolutional models and stuff like that. So this is a, a nice, uh, you can just copy paste code and, and see how, or just open the, the GitHub file and see how the how it is implemented. You don't need to go to C or C++ code, right? So Torch has a few like components that are all optional when using Torch. So I'll, I'll talk about uh, the most useful uh, for now and the ones that exist in the in the R package, package right now. So in the center, there is to, the torch package and we have the autograd system, the optimizers, the tensors, which is the, the most important data structure in torch. We have the array computation library. Uh, it means like all the operations that you can do with tensors. We then have the NN models, the data sets and data loaders. There's like a draft of implementation of distributions that are, uh, it's nice to, to say it's Christoph that is implementing this. So it's already a community con contribution, right? So let's start with the tensors. 
So um, every tensor has a data type that is like it's a float tensor, an integer tensor, or a float 64 tensor. So this is the data type. Every tensor also has a device. So currently we, we have uh, support for uh, CPU devices, which means like basic CPUs of all computers and also GPUs. So you can uh, store a tensor in the, in, the, in the GPU. Every tensor also has dimensions. So a tensor is just a chunk of, of memory with numbers in there and you can and every tensor has a, a, di a dimension that will say if it's a matrix or if it's a, an array, a three-dimensional array or a four-dimensional array, or I don't know. Every tensor has methods. So methods are most operations that you can do on tensors. And every tensor has this um, special attributes called requires grads that I'll talk about when I talk about uh, auto grads. So, uh, uh, and, but this is important for the auto grad system, right? And then we have the, uh, every tensor has a layout, but we won't talk about this right now, but basically is how the tensor is stored in memory if it's on, if it's like the device for the the order, if it's rows first and then columns, or it's column first, so it's not it's not that important for us. Okay, so first first thing of tensors is that you can create tensors from our device from our objects as with the torch underscore tensor function. And it has like a slightly uh, uh, difference from our default types. So when you convert a integer from R to torch, you will have a long tensor, which is a, an integer 64 in R, which would be a, an integer 64 in R. But we found this is convenient because most of the Torch API expects uh, long, long tensors and not uh, uh, just integers. So this is what happens when you convert a, a, a Torch tensor, a, an R object to a Torch tensor, right? And you can also pass matrices and arrays to the Torch tensor function and you will have the equivalent type. Uh, what else? Only integers, doubles, and logicals are supported at the moment. We don't we don't support uh, complex types, although it, it's not a lot a lot of work theoretically. And we also don't support string tensors right now. Um, that's it. So. This is like the way you can convert our objects to Torch tensors, but you can also initialize tensors directly in Torch. For example, using the initialize the initialization functions, like the, the Torch underscore rent n function takes like the shape you want to uh, that your tensor to be. So you want a, a two by two matrix, you just pass two and two, and you get a, 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 a torch tensor that is initialized with the random, random uh, normal distribution with zero mean and one of standard deviation. There is the torch underscore range that we initialize with uniform, with the uniform distribution. And all the, uh, there are many other initialization functions that you can use for to initialize or create new tensors in R. Okay. You you can find uh, all the a, a list of all the uh, 
the, the, the functions here. There is a torch A range to create a tensor in a range. There is torch empty uh, to create an empty tensor with like just whatever it is on memory that it, it won't do anything. There is the I to return an identity mat matrix and all, 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 all that, that this list. Yeah, so this is how you can create torch tensors. You can take our object and convert to torch tensors. You can also initialize them directly in torch. And then, and now let's start with the operations that you can do in tensors. So first thing is that you can um, index tensors or subset, whatever you want. So you just use the bracket operator and you get the first element of this tensor. For example, here I have a tensor with one, two, three, four, five, and I just indexed it to take the first element. And so this is uh, tor the torch tensors like in our uh, indexes starts starting with one, right? So not like PyTorch that starts with zero. So this is something that we adapted for the R language, but we we have we choose to to take a slightly different uh, semantic for the negative indexing. So in R, when you index with a neg negative number, you get the, that element removed. But in torch, it will take the last element minus this value. So this, so x bracket uh, minus one will take the last element of this tensor. Okay. And so there's no way to remove uh, elements with negative indexing in torch for R. And there's a more detailed uh, documentation about indexing in Torch in this link that you can just just look if you want. So you can also index with uh, intervals, and here it's slightly optimized. It. So instead of uh, evaluating this this expression to the one to the number, whatever you have, it will instead uh, pass this directly to C++ and C++ will, will know that this is an interval and it's faster than if you just type, if you uh, would like pass every element here. And you can also uh, do things like this, like take the last three elements of a tensor with this syntax. And N here is a special syntax sugar for saying like the last element. So this will take the minus three, the third starting from, from the end of the tensor and go until the last element, okay? And it, Another thing that is, that is syntax sugar in Torch is that you can use the dot dot uh, syntax to say like take all dimensions until this one. So if you have a tensor that might be 4D or might be 3D, you can still take the last uh, the, the last dimension of this tensor easily. Okay, so this will take the first element of the the first uh, element of this dimension three here and return a matrix two by two, okay? Like in R, you have the drop equals false uh, argument that you can use to not drop the dimensions. So by default, we always drop the dimensions that are just one. And there's also the new axis uh, syntax to for adding a new dimension to a tensor. So you can just say like everything new axis and it will add a, 
uh, one dimension to the, to this tensor. Okay. Um, all the subset assignment operations work as expected to, so you can modify values inside a tensor just like you would do in R. Okay. We can also uh, see how we can uh, access attributes of the tensors. So first you can, you saw in other slides, I was using the dollar shape. So the dollar operation is used to access methods and attributes of tensors. So the shape of the tensors can be accessed with dollar shape. The D type of the tensors can, can be accessed, uh, the data type of the tensors can be accessed with dollar D type. The device can be accessed with dollar device. So this is saying this tensor is hold, is stored in the, C, in the CPU memory. And the requires grad attributes is accessed like this. Okay, all tensors have all these attributes. You, you can be sure that all tensors have this. There are tensors that the shape is, uh, uh, is new because it's a, a single tone dimension. It's a tensor without dimensions that, that also exists. It's a scalar tensor, okay? Um, to modify attributes, you you use the two method. So you pass you pass like for example, we started with this tensor that is long tensor because it takes R integers and R integers are uh, stored as long torch torch tensors. And suppose that I want to convert this tensor to a float tensor, you can just do like this, use the two method and pass like d type equals torch float, and then it will become a, a float tensor. Okay. And you can also change the device of tensors this way. Just saying like move this tensor to the CUDA device. And this, this is what uh, the two method does. And it's good to always use the named argument here. So because if you look at PyTorch codes, it's uh, usually they don't do uh, named arguments, but there's a, a, a slightly difference in the, in, in the implementation. So please use, use named arguments when using the two method. Okay, so this is how you modify uh, attributes of a tensor. Right, so now let's talk about the array computation library in Torch. So Torch has a comprehensive uh, array computation library. It, it has more than 200 functions and methods to manipulate tensors. And now I, I'll just say the difference between uh, tensors and methods and between the functions, what I'm saying that it is functions and what is methods. So most torch underscore functions will operate on tensors. And they, for example, this function will take the mean of, of all the elements in this tensor. But it, you can also use the method uh, mean of this tensor. So if you do dollar mean uh, and parentheses, you will, you will have the same value, okay? So this, these are equivalent code. And uh, most of the times you can just choose between if you want uh, to use the torch function or the, or the, the method. There's no difference most of the times, right? And all functions like uh, that operate on tensors will start with torch underscore. And you can just use the autocomplete in our studio to, to see the list. Um, so yeah, 
there is some and there's the full list here in the reference page for example uh, clamp uh, convolutions uh, cumulative max cumulative mean and dot product uh, eigenvalues and many, many functions, okay? So, yeah, I'll, I, I won't say all functions, of course, but I'll, I'll just say like functions that can be useful, uh, at least for me, I, I found hard to find to the names for those functions, for example, if you want to concatenate two tensors, you can use the cat function. So the torch underscore cat function, it takes a list of tensors and it, it will concatenate uh, them in the, in the first dimension. Oh, sorry. And there's also the unbind function that will do the, the inverse of concatenation. So it will split tensors in a, in a dimension if you need. Okay. So, and the methods are always uh, called, are always called with the dollar operator. So X dollar mean will call the mean method in this tensor. And there's a special uh, type of methods that are the methods that end, end uh, which names ends with underscore. So these methods are important because they are they modify uh, the tensor in place. Okay, so what I am saying is that, for example, here, I have this tensor, which has one and two in, in, in stored in, in their value in its values. And I'm calling I'm, I'm assigning the result of this operation add underscore to to an, a new tensor called Y, but then I, I'll, I am printing the X tensor and you will see that we added one to this tensor, okay? And this is, this is important because like, whenever you see a, a, a method that ends with underline, you will know that this method operates in place on the tensor, okay? This is useful in many, many, many times I'll, I'll, I'll see, I'll let you know when I talk about this, but yeah, there are many times that you want that the operations are operate on the, in place instead of just returning a copy, okay? The, in this link, you can find a, a list of all available methods in, in Torch and so now let's talk about autograd. So autograd can convert, can automatically com uh, compute exact derivative of tensor operations. And uh, this is the core feature of Torch that allows, allows you to use Torch for train deep neural networks because usually this is what you want. Uh, you, you need to compute a lot of derivatives for deep learning. And if you had, if you had to do that manually, it, it would be a lot of, it would be much error prone. So it's, it's a good feature to have for a library for deep learning. Okay. So the way it works, uh, is you take a, a torch tensor and you need to set that you want this tensor to be tracked by, by torch. So you, you say that this tensor requires grad. Okay. So when I say this is true, I'm saying, I'm, I'm telling torch to track all the operations that happen in this tensor. Okay. And now, for example, I, I did this operation with, with X. I, I just, uh, I don't know, I just did this, this operation to, to X. 
and I call uh, and I save it in the Y uh, tensor. And then if I call Y backward, that means takes take Y and compute all all great all derivatives for all for all tensors that require its grad uh, in, the, in the chain that leaded to y, right? So when I do this, then the grad attribute of, of x is populated and it's now 12. And why it's 12? Because it's, it's how you compute the derivative of this operation. You just like say that it's three uh, times x uh, squared okay and this is and this is why this value is 12 okay so this is how you use the autograd system from torch so notice that when you do the, the y backward then the x tensor is modified in place to so the the grad attribute is available with a value with a different value, okay? Um, you can also, so this works for every operation that you do with torch. So it, whenever you use torch sum, torch mean, torch ABS, torch, whatever you want, you, uh, it, it will use the, the, how do I say this? It, it, Torch will automatically know how to compute the derivatives. But sometimes um, you, you have a, a function that is not, uh, that Torch doesn't know how to compute the derivatives. And you can also extend the autograd system of Torch by implementing what we call an autograd function I, I won't uh, talk about the details here, but it, basically what you need to do is say, like, how do you compute the, the value of this, this operation and then uh, uh, of this function and how to compute the derivative. You just need to implement both, both uh, functions here. And then you can use this function as any other tensor operation uh, in Torch, and Torch will know how to compute the gradient of, of that. Okay, basically, you just need to say, tell, to, uh, 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 tell Torch how to compute the derivative of your custom function, right? This can also be useful if you have like a, a, a function that, if you knew that the operations would be uh, fuse it like you are doing a multiplication and then a, a, then squaring for example you would have uh, a way to compute uh, the gradient faster so you can also use this even if torch knows also how to to compute the, the derivative okay um, you can find the documentation for extending autograd here and you can learn more about Autograd in this uh, secrets post that is available in the RStudio AI blog. I think she does a, a much better job than me explaining this. So please read that, that blog post if you are interested. And there is a white paper describing how uh, PyTorch implements automatic differentiation here. And it's nice if you are interested in the details of how Torch tracks the operation and stuff like that, right? So now let's talk about the neural network models. So everything, uh, so neural network models in Torch are the main abstraction for implementing models and, uh, and layers that what's what's called in Keras, for example. So this is the main abstraction in Torch and something that it, you will use a lot in, if you use Torch for building machine learning models. 
So everything in Torch is a is a model. And first, a conceptual uh, uh, introduction to this is that like a model in deep learning, at least, is like a function that has a, a state that must be maintained. We could implement this in R with something like this. So the state of the, this function is, is the weight of, of that. So for example, here, I am implementing a, a linear model that has the, the weights and a bias uh, parameter. And so this will be the state. And then this will return a function that takes an input and does what this, this function is supposed to do. So it takes, it make, it does the matrix multiplication of inputs and, and the weight and adds the bias, right? So this is how we would implement in pure R all the, the models. But then it's hard to, if, if we implement like that, it's hard to access the, the weights here because the state, right? Because it's, it's not that, that trivial to access the, the environment of a function and stuff like this. So, and there might be not only parameters, but other stuff in, in this environment that becomes hard to parse. So what, what we have in Torch is a convenient interface to implement uh, this kind of code, okay? So we use for that the NN model function that takes these two functions as inputs so it will take always the initialize method that can take any arguments and initialize all the weights of all the state of this, this model. So for example, here, I am initializing the, the W parameter and the bias parameter. First, uh, uh, I am initializing W with uh, Random with a random normal, random standard normal with this size, with this shape. And I'm initializing the bias parameter with zeros with this shape. And then you also implement the forward method that is like, how do you combine these weights into operations, right? So here, for example, this is doing the matrix multiplication of this stuff. Okay, and then you initialize a layer by calling this way. So I'm saying the input features is 10 and the output features must be one. So when I do, when I call this line, this will actually run the initialize function and return a, a, an object. And then you can just call this new object that uh, is returned as a just like a, an R function and it will operate on, on an input tensor, for example. Okay, so I'd say that models in Torch are optional. You can use, if, if you prefer this approach, you, you can also use this, but then you will have a hard time uh, finding the weight and all, keeping track of weight and stuff like that. But Everything in Torch is optional. So if you don't want to use models, you, you can just not use them, okay? It's not uh, mandatory. And so now we will see how we can manage the state of, the, of an NN model, okay? So first of all, there is this parameters mod, uh, method that can be used to list all parameters that, I, that are in a model, in a model, okay? So if you call uh, the objects dollar parameters, you will see a list of all parameters in this, in this model. And you can also access them like that, just dollar and their name and you get that parameter and see the, its values and 
do whatever you want. And there's another thing that is useful is that you, you can use the two method for models that what will it will do is like, for example, change all data types of all parameters, or for example, this is highly used is that you, you can uh, move all parameters of a model to a, a different device. For example, here, I am moving all the parameters of this model to the CUDA device. Okay, this is useful because otherwise, if, if we didn't use NN models, you would need to access the environment of this of the this function and then find all parameters and do the and call the two method in each parameter to move them to to a different device and etc so if you use nn models you get all that for for free okay and another cool thing in in this is that all models uh, implemented in the Torch R package are implemented directly in R. So you can just see how the, the linear model is implemented in R. It's just like a simple R code with uh, no magic behind it. So this is a, a good way to, to hack. And for example, if you want a, a new mo linear model that there's a different uh, weight in initialization or something like that. You can just copy paste this code and, and search and do something with that and, and paste in your own script and modify whatever you want, okay? So this is a, a, a good thing to know. And also if you find a bug, it's easier to debug because it's simple R code, you can just uh, browse, uh, put a browser statement inside and see everything that it, that is going on. Okay. Another useful things about models is that is that uh, it it can handle sub models. So, for example, you can have a, a model that has multiple different models inside of of it, and then when you call the the parameter the parameters method of this model you it will list all parameters that that are inside it including the ones that are in the sub models okay so this is useful for many many things and including this this useful because you can instantly have a list of all parameters in your model and you you can easily modularize your code without having any disadvantage, okay? Um, yeah, there are models, for example, the ReLU model that doesn't have any state, but it's perfectly fine. You can have models that don't have state and that's life, that they exist also and they they, they are just like models that have state, okay? And yeah, so in this case, the initialize function is might be empty and you just need to implement a forward method. Okay, next we have uh, sequential uh, models that that can be implemented with the NN sequential function and you pass a list of models and the NN sequential function will build the forward method directly for us. So you don't need to write this and it will, it will just call all models in the order that you, you pass it here and that's all, okay? And you can also list parameters of things that are generated by and then sequential and everything just just works. Yeah, all models implemented in the torch package start with the nn underscore uh, prefix. So it's easy to find to and list all, all of them and 
use the autocomplete features and why not? But you can also use the functional API, which, which is the functions that we start with NNF uh, prefix. And they are just, mo most of the times, they are just the forward operation, okay? So it's, it's like, it's the function without, uh, that takes the state as, as input. So you, if you have, uh, sometimes you, you have uh, an application for that, that you don't want to create a model, you, you can just use the functional uh, API and that, that will work, okay? So now let's talk about optimizers. And optimizers are the torch abstraction for defining uh, optimi optimization steps. So usually in SG SGD-like optimization, you will have something like that. You have a list of parameters, you have a learning rate, and then when you are updating the, the model parameters, you will need to do something like that. For each parameter, you will do like parameter less uh, sub is just like minus. So parameter minus the gradient of that parameter times uh, multiplied by the, the learning rate. So, and then you zero the gradient for that parameter. So this is usually the approach that you would do in SGD uh, optimizations. And the optimizers in Torch does that does exactly that, but in but it's hidden in a function, so you don't need to care about which parameters you are optimizing, if the how you set the learning rate, if you forgot to zero the gradient of that parameter, if you forgot to disable the the how do I say that the the auto grad system for that operations. So it's it's a good abstraction for optimizing. So instead of writing this loop for updating the parameters, you can simply declare the optimizers. And whenever you call optim step, it will do what is in this loop mostly. Okay. And so optimizers will always encapsulate code responsible for updating weights in the model. And all the optimizers are implemented in R directly also. So this is a, a good thing also because you can just, if you need to implement a different optimization algorithm or something like that, you can just go to the R code and see how it's implemented for the ISGD and like hack this, this if you want. So we, we don't hide anything in C or C++ here. And, and so most optimizers would be easy to implement these ways, but there are uh, other optimizers like Adam or SGD with momentum that you will need to store some state and stuff like that, that would be high, would complicate a lot this loop. So the optimizers uh, are a good abstraction for that. Just use the, the optimizers, okay? Um, yeah, thanks to Christoph, uh, we have many, many optimizers. I, be, when, when we launched uh, and released it, Torch for the first time, we only had SGD and Adam and Christoph implemented all the, all these five of, uh, optimizers. So this was a, a really awesome contribution. Okay. If you, there are still some, some optimizers that are missing and there's some discussion in this issue. So if you want to contribute uh, and implement an optimizer, just go there and let's chat and, and we, can, we can just make sure that we are not duplicating work. Okay. And we have also implemented some learning rate schedulers. So you can uh, uh, 
decrease the learning rate while using the optimizers. I won't go in, in details for that, but Sigrid has used that in, in this blog post that it, that it uh, is about classifying images with Torch. And you can just he just see how how she uses the learning rate schedulers there. Next, the next abstraction in, in Torch is the data sets. So uh, most of many times your, da your data set doesn't fit entirely on RAN and you need an abstraction for reading this data set in batches. So the data sets in Torch is a good uh, abstraction for that. And also I should note that data sets are optional. So if you don't use, don't want to use the data sets API, you just don't need to use them and just fit the batches uh, to your model the way you prefer. Okay, it's just an optional API. And but let me explain how this works. So, a data set is created using the data set function, and like the models, you have the initialize method that will take like for example, paths to images or like inputs that, that are states of, of this data set. It's common to have something like that, like the, the data set takes all the paths to, to the images that you want to use for training, for example. And then you can store this in the self object inside the data set and access then in other methods, okay? You also need to implement the get item, the dot get item function. And this is the most important method that you need to implement. It will take an index, so a number, one, two, three, four, five, or I don't know, 10,000, and return uh, the observation uh, related to, the, to that index. So for example, here, this data set takes a list a vector of paths to images, and the get item method takes uh, the index and reads the path the image in this uh, in this index in the vector of paths. Okay, and then it it will return the this the image a list with the image and the label of that that image. Okay, basically, this is this is what you need to do. It will take an index and return the 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 the, the train the how do I say that the labels and the and the values for the for that uh, for that observation. And it, you can you need also to implement the length method that just says uh, how large uh, is this data set. And then you can initialize uh, the data set using, using it just like a function. So it's a function of the initialize, uh, identical to the initialize. So this function takes labels and paths. So I'm passing paths and labels here. And then, for example, if you uh, subset a data set, this will call the get item method with with i equals one and just read the first image and return that. And you could call the length method on a data set and see what, what is its length. Okay, so a few comments is uh, the initialized function in your data set can do whatever you want. It's common to like put uh, the downloading data inside the initializing method and caching it or on some directory. It's common to like, you can split the data there also. You can, I mean, you can do whatever you want in this function. It, it can do some pre-processing or something like that. Uh, yeah. So, Currently, we only support map datasets, 
Uh, and when I say that, I mean that we only support uh, data sets that has a, a limited amount of indexes. But in, in PyTorch, there, are support, there is support for uh, arbitrary length data sets. You can learn more about that here. And we, we also plan to support this in the future. Uh, what else? The get item, the dot get item method can also do anything you want. It's common to normalize normalize the, the data there or uh, read the data from disk or do some kind of data augmentation, do some other pre-processing, whatever you want, you, you can do that there, okay? And since all data sets are also implemented directly in R, you can find uh, many implementations of data sets that you can check and, and see how, how it is implemented. For example, this is the CIFAR 10 data set implemented in Torch Vision. So here we download the CIFAR data cache to a directory and then it just reads the, the data. Okay, and there, there are many other uh, things that you, you can see here. You can, you could query like in the dot get item method, you could query from a database also anything you want. Okay, about data sets and now uh, the next abstraction is the data loaders. So data loaders take takes data sets and uh, and a batch size, and it will load, it will run that data set. So it takes uh, a, a few elements and combine them in a single tensor. Okay, so for example, you can build a, a, a data set from tensors using the tensor data set function, and then use the data loader. Using the data loader function, we pass this data set, DS with a batch size of 50. And we can iterate this data set like that. So you take the first element of this data set, it's size uh, 50 with 10 columns, just like the X uh, 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 matrix here. And just like the Y matrix, the second one here is one by 50. Yeah, is 50 by one column, okay? So it's easy to iterate over data loaders using the enumerate uh, method. So you can just call, call it like that. And it will automatically uh, combine all tensors into a, a batch, which is also very useful, okay? And it can shuffle and resamp and, and it can shuffle the data if you, if you want, and there are some other options there. So this is something that we need a lot of future work in the R side. So we need we need to implement uh, parallel data loaders, which means that each call to data set get item function could be called in a different uh, process. So we, we could make uh, data loading much faster. So this is a uh, planet work uh, for me, and we will probably use the Coro. Uh, this is a new package by Lionel uh, he at our studio. So we will probably use that to fetch data sets in, in, in parallel, okay? I think I am out of time for a full example. So I, I I don't know, like maybe we can do this in, in the end if if you ha all have time, but I, I'll, I'll skip that and leave like, what I was going to show is, uh, is an example from the blog. So I was going to comment every code line in this blog post, but I think, uh, but surely Sigrid uh, did an awesome work here. So just, uh, you can just read uh, uh, her blog, her blog post, and ask me questions or uh, post issues on on GitHub if you have uh, any anything.
that you found confusing or anything, okay? And now I'd like to talk about how to contribute to Torch development. So no matter what are your current skills, you can contribute to Torch development. Uh, that's true. If you never use it, never did any deep learning, you can contribute to Torch. If you don't use R always and you are like, I don't know how to contribute, you can also contribute. Feel free to open issues, comment on open issues and uh, comment, uh, give feedback about uh, documentation and whatever you want, okay? If some part of the documentation is not clear and feel, uh, I want you to really feel free to reach out uh, on GitHub and, and say, this is not clear to me. I, I, I think you can make it better. This will help a lot, okay? Uh, also opening bug, uh, bug reports or feature requests uh, are a great way to, to, to contribute. And just if you are planning to add a new feature or like uh, uh, something, just uh, uh, it's great to start a discussion on, on, on an issue and I'll, I'll give guidance and help uh, with anything, okay? And also you can contribute extensions to Torch and we have a lot of those now. So for example, the Torch Vision package is an extension to Torch that uh, is useful for com computer vision tasks. It implements data sets and transformations uh, for image data. It also has some pre-trained models implemented that you, you can just use. The, this blog post about, about classifying images in, in Torch already uses the the Torch Vision package. It's on CREN also. There is the Torch Audio package by Atos. Atos is a colleague of, of mine and he's worked on Torch Vision for his master uh, thesis. And it's a really great package that implements many audio data transformations like spectrograms, uh, male frequency, uh, stuff and it's ready to use. <clears throat> there are some data sets there too that you can just start using and models, okay? The targets package by Will uh, Landau, uh, which is um, a functional, uh, a function oriented make like declarative workflow for R. It's, it's a great package for building re reproducible projects. Already uh, supports torch models, so this is really nice. You can pass, you can ser serialize torch models with, with with the targets package. We have bootstrapped a torch data sets package that is that has some data sets that doesn't fit well in Torch Vision, either because there's a large dependency or something like that. And you can contribute uh, new data sets if you want. We use a lot the Pings package here. So you can download data from, from Kaggle, for example, uh, and use it in the, in, the, in the model, okay? This is also used in the, class, in, in the image classification uh, uh, post by secret, okay? Uh, we have also uh, started implementing the tabnet uh, package. It's, it's a package to fit the, the tabnet model, which is a, a famous model for, for tabular data uh, using deep learning. Uh, it's a paper by Google people, and it, it's really a working in progress package. I, I opened a lot of issues, and most of them is like, I want to make a, a, a Parsnip compatible interface, so you can use Tabnet the same way you, you 
you would use XGBoost uh, if you want. And there's a lot of issues here if you want to contribute to, to TabNet. And your idea, I mean, if you want to implement a new extension to Torch, that would be awesome. I, I, I'm happy to help with anything I can and anything, really anything you want, uh, I'll be happy to help. Okay, and give guidance and everything. Okay, now like our future work, we we are planning to have better interop with PyTorch. So for example, if you use Reticulate, we want you to be able to share Torch R tensors to PyTorch tensors with zero cost. So you could build a mixed model like using PyTorch and using R Torch if you want. We will add support for parallel data loaders and iterable data sets. We need to improve performance in Torch, uh, especially in the dispatcher. The dispatcher is what uh, is the code piece that decides which uh, uh, C function we need to call. And this has a significant overhead in Torch uh, calls. And we will also work on support for JIT for, for you to be able to uh, serialize uh, Torch uh, models built with R to Torch script. And the Torch script format is something that you can deploy without a, a Python or R dependency. So it's really, uh, it's a re really cool thing to have. So you would be able to deploy a, a model built with Torch for R in, a, in an iOS device or an Android device or something like that. And similarly to the JIT, we want to add support for ONNX, which is uh, something similar to Torch script, but more general in the sense that it, it works for TensorFlow, it works for uh, XGBoost, if I'm not wrong, or other machine learning uh, frameworks. So it would be nice to have a, a support for, for that because you, you could export uh, models built in R to many other uh, uh, environments. Okay, thank you very much for the for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, learning about the Torch for R package, and I'll open for questions. Uh, just post in in the chat. Uh, whatever you want to, to learn or ask me, okay? Thank you so much, Daniel. That was really interesting. Thanks, Alice. Um, I, there, does, I, there, there is one question here. Yeah, I see there is this, why use PyTorch? Why, when uh, there is RTorch? So, yeah, I mean, PyTorch is a much larger ecosystem uh, in the sense that there are many, many different libraries. For example, there are PyTorch Geometric, there are a much larger support for text uh, data. For example, there is Torch Text, Torch, uh, uh, I don't know, like there's Pyro, there's, there's, there's a library for probabilistic programming with Torch. So the PyTorch ex ecosystem is much larger. So I think I would do the, the, the other question actually, like why use the R Torch while there is PyTorch? And I think this is uh, like with a smaller community, it's nice to, it's easier to learn and contribute. You can, for, uh, there you can like participate on the development and pick features that you want uh, to implement that it's much harder in PyTorch. Um, and I don't know, like I don't want to compete with PyTorch because uh, it's impossible, it's much, much larger. But I, I really feel that 
for if you have a an, uh, project that you are building in R, it's really nice to have a a, a torch uh, PyTorch like API that is native to R that you don't need a, a Python dependency that you you can uh, uh, train your model in the, in the tools that you are that you are already using and and so. I think this is the main motivation for that. Okay. And there's this Javier question. If I don't have a GPU, what, op what options do I have? So you can uh, use Torch in Colab. That works. Let me see. Secrets has written some, some posts with links to to Colab. So Colab is a Jupyter Notebook-like uh, interface that is hosted by Google. And it looks like a Google Drive uh, documents, I, I feel. But it, you can run R here, and you have GPUs. You can find uh, here, I don't know. Like, you can change here and, and just, uh, oh, it's here. Yeah, you can select a, a hardware accelerator here so you can you can have a free gpu if you want to use with R, but then you don't have r studio so this is not really like i don't know uh, and you you can also use paper space paper space has a free tier of gpus also so and then you have access to a to a GPU machine that you can install whatever you want. So, and then you can install, for example, our studio server and run things on the GPU. Uh, you can also use Kaggle notebooks with free GPUs. So yeah, I think those are the, the three options, three main options. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Marcelo, Matt, Tom, and Jim. Thanks for watching. Yeah, I think I think that's about it, Daniel. Um, we're gonna leave them with an interview from Secret. Uh, you know, like we're past the hour, so sorry about that. But like, if you're interested, you're definitely more than welcome to stay and listen to this. And uh, if not, I'm sure we'll we'll have the chance to connect on uh, Twitter or uh, in this channel as well. And thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Javier. And let's talk about Torch, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the first question just has to be why, right? Why another deep learning framework for R? So we have TensorFlow, I mean, <laughs> as you know, because you're the not only the maintainer, but I think you also wrote the original code, or you wrote a lot of the original code for TensorFlow. Anyway, you were playing a big role in that, and now now Torch. So why why that? <laughs> yeah, I, I think there's uh, different motivations for both TensorFlow and, and Torch. Um, it's like, I don't know, it, like the, the main thing about Torch is that it, it's built in, in the libtorch, uh, which is the which is a C plus plus library, and it, yeah. it and this makes like Torch behave much uh, uh, more like. I don't know. I, I think I I get uh, get what you're saying. So uh, I mean libtorch. This really means we're we're not not binding to Python, right? I mean, there's no Python uh, in the middle anymore. Uh, I mean, what comes to mind when I think about that uh, with TensorFlow, we, there are always these installation issues, right? I mean, um, because Python is complicated and especially depending on which you OS you're on, right? And it's hard to help people actually so, I mean, I often feel bad when I see how many issues there are and then I can't really help because uh, I'm not on their system and I'm not even on Windows. And so, 
yeah i mean that's a big thing right not having yeah, I, in there yeah i think like in in there are a few motives like and differences between torch and tensorflow for example like torch is built on the c++ library while mm -hmm. tensorflow uses the python one and this has some implications for example um, it's easier to, to like you you will find all uh, everything that is in TensorFlow for Python will be instantly available for TensorFlow for R. Yeah, for R. yeah. And this true. is not true for, for Torch. But I think the trade-off of uh, not depending on Python is worth it because mm. you have a much lighter runtime and, and it's much easier to install. It's easier to even like integrate with other R features without needing to pass through Python makes a huge deal. So yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The, um, I mean, it's basically just so uh, it's basically just install the packages torch, right? And and that's it, right? So it, uh, it downloads libtorch for you. And, yeah, um, yeah, it's, it seems like it's all uh, it's, it's uh, just install dot packets, but we actually auto uh, install uh, libtorch and liblantern, yeah, with, uh, which are like uh, external libraries that we can't uh, distribute via CRAN. So we need to yeah, so to install mm -hmm. that in a separate step. And it detects your OS, right? So because libtorch has different versions per OS, and that's all done for you. And also, I think it also detects if you have a GPU, right? Yes, if if you have a, a GPU installed in conventional locations, will uh, the yeah. script will find it and install the GPU uh, version of libtorch. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I mean, uh, that's great. So it's one single command and then you can type uh, torch tensor, uh, for example, one or whatever, and that's it, right? And uh, yeah, um, actually, you mentioned lib lantern. So what's, what's that? Yeah, uh, this is like, I think it's the trickiest part in, in torch is that um, 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 I, I think we, we should start by libtorch, actually, it, it's okay. on Windows, it can only be compiled with Visual Studio, mm -hmm. because uh, like all the CUDA support is not implemented in other compilers for Windows, so okay. you need to compile with Visual Studio, but mm -hmm. R itself cannot compile with uh, uh, with Visual Studio, you need to compile oh, okay. with uh, with a compiler called MinJW, which is like a port of GCC to Windows. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, like we end up with two interfaces that are compiled with different compilers. Oh and God, yeah. yeah. Usually, this doesn't work very well for for things that are are not C based, mm -hmm. uh, like the and, and C++ won't work with if you compile with different compilers usually. Oh, okay. So, mm -hmm. so we needed to build Lantern, which is a C interface to libtorch, which is C++. Okay. okay. So, uh -huh. so we can interact. So R can interact with uh, libtorch without being compiled with the same compiler. So oh, wow. Uh -huh. So, so, so a C interface to libtorch, does this mean that uh, in theory, some third party could also make use of liblantern? Like uh, if someone else, I don't know, from some other language wants to bind to torch, could they also make use of lantern? Yes, in, in the beginning, we, uh, and it's mostly Javier that, Javier Loraski uh, at our yeah. studio that worked on lantern. And in the beginning, we we split it the uh, both projects. So Lantern was a, an in the, independent re repository with uh, all compiler to chain okay. by itself. And uh, 
at some point we decided to merge because like it was easier to yeah to mm -hmm. to evolve the the R implementation like this but yeah in theory like anyone can use mm -hmm. uh, lantern even without yeah. uh using the R package. Oh, that's pretty yeah, interesting. So syntax. perhaps someone will contact you sometime for, <laughs> I don't know, yeah? Yeah, <laughs> and we could, at this point, like probably the R interface will be much more mature and we will be able to split the projects and maybe something ah, like Okay, this. yeah, 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 interesting. And as we're talking about this, I mean, now, now for Torch, our, our Torch, um, so this has uh, R code, right? And it also has C++ code, right? And yep. what's the, uh, what's the, the division or what's the separation? What, what, is, what is being done in C++ and what do you do in R? Yeah, so we, we made, I, I mean, all, most of the C++ code in Torch is just like, uh, auto-generated code to bind okay. uh, uh, the R package to libtorch. So most C++ code uh -huh. will, will be just just wrappers. And yeah, yeah. Does this and, mean? Can I interrupt? Does this mean yeah, like sure. if there's a new libtorch version, you just generate uh, a new version of that part, so you don't have to like <laughs> go everywhere and track the changes manually and all that? Yes, yes. Most, uh, I mean, I I would say like ninety five percent is auto generated mm -hmm. there are some wrappers that we had to write by hand because it's okay. uh it's like uh special cases or yeah, something yeah. like this but mm -hmm. most most of of the code uh -huh. is, is i mean that sounds good right because when i think of our our tensorflow and carols it's more like manual tracking of changes right it's not so automated the when it yeah. releases yeah, that, yeah yeah it's in theory like this is uh yeah in in tensorflow for r we mostly adopted a way that we are the r package is agnostic of the of the tensorflow version so yeah. mm. the keras okay. r package works with uh, TensorFlow 2, 2.1, 2.3, and 2. Yeah. I don't know. And, and, uh, and, but yes, in Torch, that, that would never, that would not happen. Like mm -hmm. we, we take a libtorch version and the Torch version only works yeah. with this, uh, libtorch. So yeah, it, it's, like yeah that, that, that makes separation. sense yeah yeah because also with cares i think that we can run into problems right with that other strategy so i mean i sometimes yeah. just won't work anymore like when there was a change from tensorflow one to tensorflow two there was too much stuff which just didn't work so yeah 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 it's it's easier like it's much easier to depend to like maintain if you mm. if you only uh, support a single version. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. better. Yeah, I makes mean, sense. yeah, that makes sense because there's so much stuff going on all the time, right? So, but going yeah. back to the question, so so C plus plus that's mainly wrappers, and so like, how do you do it with the your network layers? Or I mean, in Torch, it's all modules, right? Not they don't call it layers. How's that implemented? Uh, yes, most most models in Torch are like simple uh, combination of the namespace namespace functions, like uh, the these functions that are auto generated. So we rewrote all the uh, um, not all yet, but most of yeah. the the models uh, in R. Mm -hmm. So. Ah, the, okay. the idea yeah. and is that like we didn't want we we want to this also tests all the torch code which is good in in our side but also yeah. it's good to like write in r because uh we can like 
there is living examples of code uh, for mm -hmm. many different layers and many different models. Right. And, yeah. Uh, and yes, this is the, yeah. the idea behind it. And, and actually, this doesn't impact, this shouldn't impact performance because, like, mm -hmm. uh, the main hard thing is still done in C, like, in the, yeah. the computations are still done in, in the C, C side. Level. So. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, so, <clears throat> speaking of implementing stuff, layer uh, modules, optimizers, whatever. So there's a lot of things to do. And what I see is there's a lot of action in the GitHub repository already. So we already have really many contributors for uh, for everything, right? Like for changes to documentation, but also for new optimizers and all. So did you expect that would go so fast? So we have so many people already. Yeah, I, I didn't expect it it hmm. would be so fast. Yeah. Like, even like uh I mean like TensorFlow has more or less the same number of contributors uh, mm. uh monthly or something like this. And TensorFlow is a much major project. Yeah. Uh but yeah, this is really great. We we had some contributions for from uh Christoph, uh, uh, that implemented yeah. a lot of optimizers, optimizers in Torch. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. We, we, that, that, yeah. I also saw even um, someone started a distribution class, right? Because, yes, uh, it's, it's yeah. also Christoph that uh -huh. is, is working on, on, on it. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's awesome. So <laughs> that, uh, please go on. <laughs> I mean, because uh, yeah. the thing is, um, I mean, there's about these structures so for the one thing is there's stuff in torch which so what are uh, i do it differently so we, basically we have a lot of core torch right like torch.nn or something like that in python and then also we have torch vision which is uh, i think pretty much complete right or i mean okay not the models probably but the functionality is <laughs> Um, but then in Torch, you also have Torch Audio and Torch Text, which are like more in the, um, which are different, uh, let me think, like wheels in Python, I think you call that, right? Different wheels. Uh, different or, packages, or I don't packages, know. Packages, yeah. modules, I don't know. Um, the yeah. stuff you install with pip install, so. <laughs> and, but um, for the whole probabilistic part, uh this is in torch dot distributions or something i think which is so that would be like normal torch but you hadn't started that yet and now we see that someone already started with that and um yeah yeah this is like i i don't know like for for tensorflow this was much easier in theory because uh all uh since you don't need to re-implement, uh, uh, you just access the Python yeah, version. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's easier mm -hmm. to wrap. And like theory. with GF probability, what you're referring to, right? So it's just yeah. really very, very direct wrapper and not much. Yeah, it's, else. it's still a lot of work usually, but it's... Yeah, it's, but it's, it doesn't add any functionality or doesn't implement anything itself. Or yeah. It's really just, just binds to, to it and that's all. So. Yeah. yeah, and like in, in Torch, we we are not following this way, but it, it's nice to see that that there is a lot of people motivated to do yeah. this kind of work, and I I think like it it end up, ends up being like better, uh, not better, but I mean like uh, if you have to mm -hmm. like re-implement and all this all this stuff you 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 have more work on that package and yeah and it's more it's it becomes usually more r friendly i guess yeah or it, yeah it's you have more freedom to implement something that That's, uh, is that's different not from python and yeah. Exactly. And yeah, that reminds me. I was wanting to ask, what if um, some optimization algorithm, which isn't yet—I mean, there's always new papers and whatever. 
and if something has not been implemented in Python, what do you think should happen? So someone wants to implement it, should should that person create an, an own package for that and uh, import Torch and uh, probably, right? Or Yeah, one thing that I, I really would like to see in R, like mm -hmm. in the optimization part, is like uh, second order uh, yeah. Methods. Yeah. Like I remember because most that. Uh, yeah mm -hmm. most optimization methods in deep learning are uh, are in the first order like yeah. SGD and mm -hmm. I don't know Adam and all these other yeah. optimizers yeah but um, in statistics like uh, since you have less data, like it's usually better to use. Uh, you, I mean, you can yeah. use the second derivative because you have less data and yeah, and it goes it much faster, right? So you don't yeah, have to the, wait forever for exactly. Wait. So uh, so yeah. I think this this one would, would be really nice, like to have second order. Uh, yeah, which one? Of, I think LBFGS they have in Torch, right? Do they have conjugate gradient? Because I remember from a long time ago in this, uh, how was it called in Java, you know, DL4J, yeah? Um, yeah. I had a data set, I don't know, must have been also some small tabular data set and nothing worked as well as conjugate gradient. So, but I don't think they have it in Python, but could be nice to have it in R, yeah. right? So. Yeah, 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 sure. Mm. Um, and, yeah. Uh, and um, going back to the ecosystem, so we had the like n narrower torchy things and the more indie not independent, but <laughs> I don't know, standing for yeah. the, somehow things like torch vision and torch audio and torch text. But then we also have all the broader ecosystem, right? Um, I mean, things for federated learning, uh, crypt cryptography, uh, encrypted deep learning, I also need to say. Uh, also stuff like, um, not PyMC, is it? I don't know. I, I think it's Pyro. Pyro, like, yeah, uh, not, not PyMC, yeah. Pyro. So, um, yeah, I guess we're also hoping for people to perhaps look at those things, right? Yeah, world. sure. Like, mm -hmm. I, I like the, the the idea of growing frameworks uh, based on Torch. Like, yeah. mm -hmm. for example, the Pyro is a probabilistic programming mm -hmm. framework built on top of PyTorch. Yeah. And I think uh are uh it makes sense to have something similar in r mm -hmm. um i i also see like all the problem spec specific packages like torch audio and torch text yeah are like nice opportunities mm -hmm. like uh, actually torch audio is uh, is already in development yeah. Uh, oh wow! Uh, I didn't uh, see that. Yeah, um, uh, Atos, which is a colleague. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think we know each oh, other. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you you know, and he's working like heavily on Torch Audio mm -hmm. this yeah. last month, I guess. So. Oh, yeah, that, that that's that's great. Uh, do you think? Um, I mean, we have the Torch stuff in this MLverse GitHub. How do they call it? Organization or do you think we could other pack uh, other these kind of packages could also live there in the MIverse repo? Should people perhaps ask you to get to get moved there or basically don't we care? I mean they could also have it like somewhere, but of course it would be nice if <laughs> if someone if somehow we get to know, right? If about all the other yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Like I mean there's no uh, like, uh, I mean, it's it's good for the ecosystem if mm -hmm. all things are in the same organization because yeah we can people can easily find all all stuff yeah, and we right. can easily mm -hmm. like uh, share and talk about I don't know like mm -hmm. but yeah it's 
I, I don't have everyone like that's a, had probably right. Mm, yeah, yeah, but I, I don't have a suggestion like uh, just just do like yeah. Oh, okay, let's I mean, talk. If someone wants to do it, they should just contact you, I guess. And uh, yeah, you know. sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, uh, what, one thing that I I, I like like for the for extensions like one thing that i i think it would be nice for r yeah. is having like model specific uh, extensions like here is this package that just fits uh, uh, an L lstm in a data set that comes this way you know like oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. less less framework and more like just a, a model package in R, you know, like. Uh, uh, but you mean it depends on Torch or is it? Uh, yeah, that depends on Torch, but yeah. hides all the the neural networks and stuff like this and provides like a, an interface uh, that says, give me a vector of texts and the response variable and I'll, I'll train you uh, an LSTM, you know, like. Yeah, something yeah, that for, sounds, for people yeah. then that don't want to learn how to implement the the model architecture and like uh, write the training loop and all that. So oh I yeah, think yeah, it, that, it that's nice to have this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Some higher. Uh, does that somehow connect to tidy models? Uh, what uh, our colleagues? Yeah, yeah, I think it would be nice to have the same like interface yeah. than tidy models. Mm -hmm. So so it can be integrated can... there even. Yeah. Yeah. But I I also see like something similar to what fast AI does. Fast AI does that yeah. as well. Like yeah, just classification model and you don't care what's inside it's just like it classifies images given yeah labels, you know? yeah i mean i don't know I mean, like that sounds yeah so i didn't want to interrupt you so um, yeah for me it's it's just like sometimes you just want to quick test and see if it works and and then learn more yeah uh, and yeah exactly so. i also uh absolutely that you're mentioning fast ai uh I mean, I think I watched at least twice the lectures. I mean, what different generations of lectures, and it's it's just I think very very good what they're doing, um, and also making deep learning accessible for for. I mean, they I think they call it for coders, but I mean, it's not you, the thing is you don't have to be an expert coder and you don't have to be an expert mathematician or statistician or. Yeah. Exactly. You can yeah. build a, a an image classification model without like needing to know every detail of the implementation. You just exactly, need to know, yeah. oh, yeah. a CNN is a good uh, yeah. method for that, and that's all you know. Like, yeah, and I I, th I think that would be super super useful. So <laughs> I think what we're just saying right now is, if someone felt motivated to do something like that to build yeah. some some R fast AI on top of R torch. I think that yeah. would be awesome, right? I mean yeah. yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah because uh, so when I looked into the code a bit in Python some time ago, um, what they're really doing is they are following and implementing best practices. I mean so I really don't like this phrase best practices, but still it's what they're doing and it's good that they're doing it because then for, uh, I mean, one classical example is the learning rate scheduling stuff, for example, right? I mean, yeah. this should just be picked for you, right? I mean, you don't, there's no need why everyone needs to read all the papers on learning rate schedulers. I mean, it's, yeah, sure. Yeah, that should just work. Yeah, and there are many like tricks like that in, right. in deep learning, like yeah. all the the scheduling and the batch size and i don't know what, right, what else like right. yeah uh, like even like detail i don't know like people might say that this is not a detail but i don't know like the batch norm must come before or after the next <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you know, like, I, I, stuff I, like this 
So, or before the activation or after? Yeah, I, re I Google that every time. So, <laughs> and then yes. I always end up somewhere where they say, oh, it doesn't really matter. Or perhaps it does. And, no, exactly. I, I also think that's so much. I think a lot of that cognitive load, which goes into this kind of stuff, should better go into, into really okay. thinking about what you want to do, right? I mean, and... Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, there's also automated training, but actually, I think I'm basically a fan of more, like, thinking about what you're doing and seeing, yeah. yeah. And, yeah, so, and, and but if you spend too much time just getting to work, it's getting... Yeah, it I think there's a, a something between all right. automatic and all, like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I think the machine learning, like, the, like, the traditional machine learning i don't mm -hmm. know how to say yeah to, but i think everyone understands like what i am referring to mm -hmm. but like uh have found some the between that is good for example like if you think gradient boosting uh, mm -hmm. there could exist like a and it exists actually like frameworks where you need to implement all the what is the 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 base function and yeah the, yeah and how to combine the the trees and all and implement mm -hmm. the loss derivative and all that stuff that stuff but most like most used uh, packages nowadays just like mm -hmm. yeah. you just need to pass the data set and the labels and you you yeah, train your you, model you, yeah. but you still have a lot of flexibility like uh, of that model so yeah yeah exactly so I, I totally agree and i also think that um, so actually i was originally planning to also come to some more generic general questions and also going a bit into the societal political context but uh, i think we don't have time for that now but the thing is if you're not spending like 100 percent of, of your time just getting the training to work you also have more, yeah, more <laughs> cognitive capacity for thinking about what you're doing in all these respects, right? I mean, what really like, is my data set perhaps problematic in some way? Is something about the whole question problematic? And I think the, the, the more we are not always stuck just in the technical side of it, the more we can address these questions. So I, I think, we basically should more or less stop here because looking at the time and uh, we talk about this stuff another time uh, but do you want to add something before we wrap up or i i don't know no yeah Actually, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i think i might perhaps want to add that just like we totally welcome and are actually very happy about any contributions for the code we would of course also like if people do something interesting or whatever it doesn't have to be spectacular just something with torch and perhaps feel like writing about it so we have this ai blog our studio ai blog and um we are we're happy to publish case studies or whatever so if someone like let's say we have Perhaps at some point we, we have that implementation of LBFGS or some, some other second order optimizer and you use it for something totally non deep learning related. Uh, yeah, let us know if you want to publish it on the blog. Also, if you don't want to write it all yourself, but just have some interesting code and but would like someone perhaps to write the story around it. That's also a way to handle that. So uh, I think we're just very happy about any contributions right and sure yeah. yeah this is something like i i am like almost all days online uh, <laughs> on github and yeah, i right. i want to answer uh, as fast as possible so yeah i mean i see that you're so so quick in answering the or fixing stuff or whatever this that's yeah. awesome so yeah so i think we're having a lot of fun with torch and we hope our listeners have too right and yeah. i think certainly had fun to talk with you and see you another time then right and thank yeah. you daniel <laughs> see you, see bye. You. thank you bye. very much thank bye you. bye